Six months on from Superstorm Sandy, will America's East Coast be ready for this year's tourism season? This is what the New Jersey shore looked like in October. Today it's in much better shape, but for some business owners, we find out how they still have a long way to go to get ready for this year's tourism season. I'll be ready for sure, and the way the town's been moving on the boardwalk, I think they'll be ready. Plus, we're on a cruise ship in Florida with a difference. The ultimate music fans trip, the rock cruise. And the app that lets your family know you've arrived safely and updates your social media pages with one simple click. And get a bird's eye view from the cockpit of a plane. That's online check-in later in the show. Hello and welcome to Fast Track, I'm Fiona Foster. Now we start this week's programme in the US, where six months ago Superstorm Sandy wreaked havoc along parts of the East Coast after tearing through the Caribbean. More than 120 people were killed and the clear-up cost over $60 billion, making it the second most expensive storm in US history. One of the worst hit areas was the New Jersey Shore, with its beaches, its boardwalks and its amusement parks, sparking fears that this summer's potentially lucrative tourism season could be a washout. Vanessa Yurkovich reports now from Seaside Heights. This roller coaster doesn't belong here. It's been sitting in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Seaside Heights, New Jersey, after it was hurled into the air by the fierce winds of Hurricane Sandy in October. The storm ravaged the seaside town, ripping through homes, businesses, and the borough's signature boardwalk. People don't realize here, there was about another 150 to 200 feet of uh, boardwalk. boardwalk. Yeah. And there was a two story haunted house on the end of it that nobody's seen since the night. Nobody of the knows where it is. It's gone. Completely gone. I still think that I'm in a dream, and I'm hoping that I'm going to wake up someday, but obviously I'm not, and the reality is here. The borough of Seaside Heights gained international recognition through the MTV reality show Jersey Shore and is now a sliver of its former self. Its economy relies on a heavy influx of tourists during the months of May through September in order to survive. To lose a season uh, in Seaside Heights is uh, very, very costly. It can really do a lot of damage to your financial wise. The basic 75% of our tax base comes from our recreational area, the beach, the boardwalk, the parking meters. And the other 25% comes from the uh, backs of the taxpayers. And if we do not have that, we are in serious, serious, serious trouble. Uh, we won't be able to pay our bills. Michael Gratian is the borough's director of community improvements. He's also a homeowner and has owned Lucky's Arcade and Pizza for 45 years. But with the damage from Sandy, he doesn't know if he can open in time for Memorial Day weekend at the end of May, which is the start of the season. I didn't have any flood insurance. I don't know many people in the board that did have flood insurance. Uh, the question now is at the point in my life and where all my equipment is gone, for 400,000, 450,000. And for me to replace it now, we're talking maybe six, seven, eight hundred. I think at the point of my life and my age that it's just, I don't know if I'm going to come back, to be very honest with you. Piece by piece, the one mile boardwalk is making its way from north to south. It's being built better and stronger. I was even offered the opportunity to help. Okay. So this is how the boards are being kept together? Yes. Okay. And this is what, a nail or a screw? screw. 
Yeah. Oh, that didn't sound it's that okay. good. Well, again, no, it's okay. Mayor Bill Akers took office only a year before Hurricane Sandy. Well, look how beautiful the ocean is. It is. But says the borough has had good support from state and federal officials. It's hard to imagine these images being worse. But according to Mayor Akers, it was. He's hired the companies to rebuild, and now it's up to them to make it happen. We've given them very tight deadlines. They've accepted contracts under these deadlines, and we put some pretty hefty penalties at the end of these contracts, whether it be $7,500 a day if you don't meet these deadlines. Until then, business owners are trying to pick up the pieces. Many are opened year-round and have moved their boardwalk storefronts from the seaside to the street side. Well, obviously, it's not the boardwalk. There's many more people that are on the boardwalk, so we do better gross. But whatever it is, it, it'll uh, support me till the boardwalk reopens. So this has been a 24-hour day type I get rebuild here, I for get you. I get here at 8, I leave here at 7 every day. Danny Merck appeared on the MTV show Jersey Shore as the roommate's boss at his store called The Shore Store. He says he lost just about everything. I'm spending my life savings on this. So all my Jersey Shore money that I did really good with and I put away, I didn't do any stupidness of like buying a Ferrari or anything stupid that a young person should do, have fun with. I saved it and now I'm spending it on just bringing it back to the way it was before the hurricane. And that's what we found up and down the boardwalk. People out of pocket because disaster relief money still hasn't arrived. In January, President Obama signed off on $60 billion of relief, with $1.8 billion allocated to New Jersey in the first wave. The state says of that, $500 million will be handed over to small businesses by the end of this month. And so this will be cleared out and safe for swimmers, hopefully by Memorial Day. No, not hopefully, 100% guaranteed. I'll be ready for sure. And the way the town's been moving on the boardwalk, I think they'll be ready. So both people are holding up their ends. We're working on our end of the businesses are, and the town's working on their end of the boardwalk. I think they'll be perfect. According to state records, four seaside counties make up half of the state's tourism income, which totaled 40 billion in 2012. Hurricane Sandy left $37 billion worth of damage in the state. It's basically all I know. I've been doing it since a kid, and I, I love to do it, and I want to keep doing it, and I want the borg to come back and people to come visit us. Put a little oomph into it. For people like Vinny Skazis, who've spent decades building their business and keeping it afloat even after Sandy, it would be hard to give up now. Hey, two big winners going out. <laughs> At the balloon game, just like the last one. Vanessa Yurkovich reporting from the New Jersey shore in the U.S. Now let's have a look at what else has been making news in the travel world this week. Here's Greg McKenzie. In Sri Lanka, security has been ramped up where police are asking hotels to hand over people's passports and visa details. They say this will ensure they can keep tourists safe. Guest houses and hotels will have to hand over a weekly report on their foreign guests. And if you're heading to Chicago, you might want to watch your step. A massive sinkhole swallowed up three cars on the south side of the city this week. The road buckled following heavy overnight rain and flooding, which also led to more than 300 flights being cancelled. Circuses in England will be banned from using wild animals under new government legislation. The rules won't come into force until December 2015, but they say that so the circus operators have time to find new homes for their animals. It's hoped the move will safeguard animal welfare, but circus groups say they are frequently inspected and that a ban is unnecessary. And finally, if you visited Laos this week, you might have struggled to stay dry. The annual water splashing festival called Pi Mai Lao left the streets soaked. The festival is a Buddhist celebration of the Lao New Year, and animals such as birds and eels are set free as part of the festivities. 
We're going to take a short break now, but do stay with us because coming up, we'll be reporting on the cruise ship that's taking to the high seas with thousands of music fans keen to meet their idols. And Carmen's here with her regular online check-in with all that's hip and happening in travel, on the web and on your handset. So don't go away. There you're watching Online Check-In, the fast track guide to all that's trending and travel on the web and on the go. I'm Carmen Roberts. Now everyone is connected these days and going away for business or pleasure no longer means being out of contact. In fact, most of us will be updating our status, tweeting, checking in, texting, sending emails or even calling our friends and loved ones to let them know we've arrived. Oh Hey World is an app that claims to streamline this process, automatically checking you in via email, text, as well as a whole host of social media sites with one simple click. And besides letting mum know you've landed safely, you could ultimately meet some like-minded people and glean some travel tips along the way. Now, I'm not so keen on letting the whole world know I'm away, but Oh Hey World has thought of that too. And there's a function to only notify a select group of contacts. If checking in with all your friends and family isn't enough, you can also share your entire itinerary, including hotel bookings, rental cars and flight schedules, on JetZet. It's a management tool that organises every aspect of your trip and allows travellers to follow one another for real-time updates. It will even find your friends on Facebook, Twitter or LinkedIn. It's a great idea, but this does rely on your friends, family and colleagues also joining JetZet. If you can't persuade your friends to sign up to yet another social website or app and you're looking for a friendly face in a foreign destination, then why not download iTranslate? This free app uses voice recognition to translate over 20 languages with a few taps on your smartphone. It's easy enough to use for simple phrases, but could get tedious if you want to have a decent conversation. But if that fails, you could just wow your newfound friends with a few key phrases from the crew at Emirates. It's called Share a Smile, enlisting the help of their cabin staff to give you a head start when it comes to making a good first impression. It's an Arabic saying that means your food is delicious. OK, it's kind of cheesy and has a limited function, but it's a fun idea. Well, here's an airline site that's far more useful. Avoiddelays.com claims to help you do exactly that based on statistics. This site lists the most delayed departure airports in the United States, the worst times to fly, the most delayed flights, as well as airport-specific tips to avoid delays. Unfortunately, the lists aren't in real time, and it's only relevant for airports in the US. 
If you've seen a similar site that dishes the dirt on tardy airlines in other parts of the world, drop me a line. The address, as always, is fasttrack at bbc.com. Or you can check out our Facebook page. Feel free to write on our wall. Or why not send us a tweet on Twitter? Like Ulrika from Germany, who wrote in to tell us about a nifty printing app. How many times have you checked in online for your flight, only to be left high and dry without a printer to print your boarding pass? Well, Berlin-based startup Easy claims to make printing quick and easy on the go. The files on your phone can be sent to any printer connected to a computer running the accompanying desktop app. Easy claims finding a printer in the future will be as easy as finding a Wi-Fi hotspot. The app itself is free, though printing might not be. Tweet of the week time now, and have you ever wondered what it's like to be a pilot? Well, Petapixel tweeted this amazing video of a bird's eye view from the cockpit. It was created by pilot Jacob Volk, who captured these photographs over the space of a week. Even if you're an elite frequent flyer, this expansive view is so different from the tiny window on the side of a plane. And finally, let me leave you with something a bit more down to earth. If you've ever been to Vietnam, you'll know that there are more motorcycles than people. Well, I exaggerate, but you get the picture. And here's an amazing time-lapse video by Rob Whitworth to prove it. Enjoy, see you next time. Now to end today, a look at a way that cruise liners are hoping to attract new passengers. Back in the 1970s, bands like Yes, Genesis and Emerson, Lake and Palmer had a huge youth following and sold tens of millions of albums around the world. Well, in recent years, some of the musicians from those bands have decided they'd like to reconnect with their old audience, who are now, of course, in their 50s and 60s. And that's where the rock cruise comes in. It's a chance for long-term fans to spend a few days with their musical idols out at sea in luxurious surroundings, with not a muddy old festival field in sight. Bob Howard now reports. There aren't many venues which are this relaxing for watching serious rock music, but Cruise to the Edge is definitely one. The organisers have chartered half of the 3,000 capacity Italian ship MSC Poesia for a five-day round trip from Fort Lauderdale in Florida. Carl Palmer from Emerson, Lake & Palmer is one of a host of rock stars who made their name shifting millions of albums in the 1970s who's playing on board. They're on holiday cruising with their favourite band. I mean, that's what they get out of it. And uh, there we are in the morning and you can see us having breakfast. And obviously converting new fans, you know, that's really what it's all about. And that's happened and, uh, as I say, it's been a, it's been a great experience. Yes are the headline act, and they're attracting some very serious fans indeed. Most fans considered the gig a great success, especially appreciating some rarely heard live songs. But yes, guitarist Steve Howe admits that playing on board in pretty rough seas brought its own challenges. The performances have been quite difficult because of the movement of the boat. That's not to say we haven't enjoyed it, but that's put an extra test on us. The steel guitar, which was very hilarious the first night. Well, I say hilarious now, of course it was driving me crazy, but it slid in a few times. Uh, it's supposed to slide in, but not when I don't want it. So without further ado, I would like you to give a very warm welcome to Yes! And further challenges arose with some fairly philosophical questions posed at something called Storytellers, where fans get to pose questions to their musical idols. Uh, can you attest to the realness of this other world of which your music speaks, or is it merely illusion and fantasy? Or... <laughs> option B... <laughs> is this a five-part question? <laughs> yes, I know, so there's a the industry has been growing at 7% per year uh, for over 20 years and I think that the reason they've been able to do that, they've continued to be uh, innovative and they've been continuing to reinvent their, their product. And I think that's what you're seeing now is them being able to 
uh, go from general cruising to now start focusing on you know, the interests of their, of their passengers. Of course, it's not necessarily the case that people boarding cruise ships are getting younger. Sometimes it's just rock fans getting older. It's, it's a young man's game, cruising, as you can see. So, you know, it's, um, it's nice to get a holiday thrown in with, you know, the chance to deafen people at the same time. In the end, it was all about the music and spending thousands of dollars for the experience was worthwhile. Can you pick up the goosebumps? <laughs> Both of us. This is probably a Prague fan's dream come true. Without question. It's the best decision we've ever made in terms of our music appreciation and taste. But the real credit has to go to the performers. God bless them for taking the, the risk. And it's so nice the fans have let the artists be the artists. We're blessed by having our bands making this music today. some rough seas and only occasional glimpses of sunshine, the organisers were very happy with the way the cruise went. And now classic British rock acts are starting to appear, the promoters say they may aim even higher on the talent pecking order in future. Rolling Stones? I could totally see three ships, you know, coming into an island, a private island, and having a, you know, having the full Stones show there. So, yeah, I, there's no limit to, to what we're looking at. It's only rock and roll, but he likes it. Bob Howard on a rock cruise in the Caribbean. And that's it for this week. Do try and join us again next week, though, when Rajan will be in Croatia on what looks like an amazing trip. Here's a preview. Thanks, Vienna. Well, as you can probably tell from the scene behind me, I'm not here to cover the romantic, glamorous Mediterranean coast in midsummer, Croatia's Riviera, if you like, or even historical Dubrovnik. No, I'm here to test the government's claim that for tourists, continental Croatia can be a land for all seasons. I start in Zagreb, the capital, to find out if this city can pass muster as a major European destination. By talking to a museum curator and a street photographer, I ask if Zagreb has a vibrant cultural scene and a style and attitude all of its own. A gastronomy expert tells me she wants people to come to Zagreb and smell, taste and immerse themselves in the city's flavours. And I find out all of this firsthand on a hired bicycle. But just how cycle friendly is this city? Then it's off to the interior of the country where the shadows of the war in the 1990s still loom over some amazing winter landscapes. The National Park at Plevica is safe and popular with tourists all year round. But not far away in Mrežnica, there are still undetonated mines that are inhibiting the development of tourism. Meanwhile, in Gospić, in the Lika region, a scene of fierce fighting during the war, locals are finding interesting ways to attract us over. An adrenaline park where, rather bizarrely, considering the history of the region, paintballing is a major feature. And there's a museum devoted to one of Croatia's most unsung heroes, the inventor Nikola Tesla. And Croatia would dearly love continental tourism to be a success because even though they're about to join the European Union, it's tourism that's been their lifeblood for the last decade. And quite frankly, it's their best chance to revive their flagging economic fortunes. Find out more with me on Fast Track Croatia Direct next week. So do try and join us for that. It looks like it's going to be a really good watch. In the meantime, though, you can keep abreast of what we're up to by following the links on the screen now. And until next time, from me, Fiona Foster, and the rest of the Fast Track team, thanks very much for watching. Bye-bye.